In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Today is the Sunday of St. Mary of Egypt, which means that next Sunday is the Sunday of the Palms, Palm Sunday, the entrance into Jerusalem. So we're entering into Holy Week very, very soon. And I think it's very appropriate that St. Mary of Egypt is the last commemoration of Great Lent before we enter into Holy Week, because basically Palm Sunday, for me, Lazarus Saturday is the entrance into Holy Week, which is the Saturday just before Palm Sunday. We always read this reading for St. Mary and also for many other martyrs as well. And Mary was a martyr, not a martyr by blood, but a martyr by witness, because to martyr means to witness. She certainly witnessed her love for Christ. And this beautiful historical event of a woman that is anointing our Lord's feet has just, it's just amazingly delicious to read over and over again. I hope you read it many times throughout the year and not just hear it in church. It has in incredibly beautiful lessons in it. And as usual, when I read the scriptures before I'm going to preach, sometimes the morning that I'm going to preach, full disclosure, most of the time, the morning that I'm going to preach and not before then, I take a pencil and I just kind of circle certain things that kind of jump out at me. Sometimes uh, very similar things jump out every year, but sometimes something different. And this time, the first thing that I circled was the Pharisee who had Jesus over for uh, dinner saw that this woman came and that she was obviously a prostitute, actually a former prostitute but I don't think she had a chance to change her wardrobe, so she looked like a prostitute to them. And they knew her as a prostitute. Since there were elite people in the room, there might have been people who knew her as a prostitute because of her business, because that's the way elite people are. They're hypocrites. And he judged her. And then he judged him, he judged Jesus, because Jesus allowed for this woman to anoint his feet, to, with uh, the ointment and with her tears and wipe them with her hair. He allowed this to happen, of course, because he knew that this was her gesture of love, of gratitude. And in another place, another uh, uh, anointing, he said it was to prepare him for his burial. Although these are two separate anointings. Most people think that they're two separate anointings that occurred. What St. Luke says is now when the Pharisee that had bidden him saw it, saw the anointing and saw this woman who he thought was a prostitute and had a bad reputation, etc. When he saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman it is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. He spake within himself. What terrible words to hear. What a terrible thing when we speak within ourselves, when we take our own counsel, which is almost always uniformly wrong to take our own counsel, and when we speak within ourselves, we don't listen to God, we listen to ourselves. Like the Pharisee who said, Oh Lord, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. That actually speaks about he spoke within himself also. Those are the words used. So his prayer was not to God, it was to himself, to the idol of himself. And so this Pharisee, who loved Jesus, but still was afflicted by this legalistic elitism that was part of the culture of, of the ruling elite of the Jews, he spoke within himself and judged Jesus. So when we speak within ourselves, we invariably judge we judge others wrongly, and we judge ourselves wrongly. Now, we give ourselves more credit than we deserve, and we don't know our sins. We're blind to our sins when we speak within ourselves. And then we're also hyper-focused on other people's sins to the, to the extent that we look at something as worse than it really is, or perhaps we don't know someone has repented, or perhaps we don't know, well, we never know really a person's inner life. To speak within himself. Now, Father Nicholas was speaking about St. Mary last night, and something which he said really struck me. And it, I'm going to kind of interpret it. It's basically what he said, but interpreted just a little bit differently, but it's the same meaning. St. Mary, she always remembered the Theotokos. She had made a promise to her. 
and she made a promise to the Theotokos that she would no longer fornicate. And so the Theotokos prayed for her, and she was allowed to go venerate the cross of her son, the son of the Theotokos, that is, of course, and then go out in the desert for 47 years until St. Zosimus saw her, where she saw no man, no animal, for 47 years. And for 17 of those years, she struggled with great intensity because of her lust and her desire for food and her desire for drink and her desire for, as she carefully said, caresses. And when she had these times, she remembered the Theotokos and she remembered the vow she had made to her. And then she would beg for help. This is not speaking within herself. This is remembering a vow that she made and then acting upon that vow. This is how we should be. We should make promises and we should fulfill them. Everyone has different promises. Some of us, all of us have basically the same. We should love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. That's what we promise to do. We do a terrible job fulfilling that promise, but we should be struggling to do it and also love our neighbor as ourselves. Others have other promises that they've made. In my pastoral life, I've made many promises and, tr and struggled to fulfill them. One of them, some of you know, is Daniel's list. And I have this large list of people that have died uh, suddenly or that, have, uh, or that pray for Daniel or that have lost someone who died suddenly. And I promised the people that pray for Daniel that I would pray for them every day on this list. And I do. And I also commemorate them in, in every liturgy that I serve. That's a vow that I made, a promise. It wasn't speaking within myself. It came out of just dealing with the grief of Daniel's death and, and doing something positive. Because if you don't do something with grief, if you don't do something with anything, whether it's good or bad, it just festers in you. So St. Mary, when she was delivered from her fornication, or at least had the germ of the deliverance, she still had the desire for 17 years, she remembered this. And so she's not speaking within herself when she says that she remembered the Theotokos and as if she could see her with a menacing face saying, you, you made a vow. And then she, of course, would pray, sometimes for a day and a night. Can you imagine a day and a night in the desert, laying on the ground, begging God to deliver her from the burning that was in her? What an amazing thing. So much different than the Pharisee who spoke within himself to himself, took his own counsel, felt himself superior to this woman that was a sinner in his mind. Mary considered herself a sinner above everyone, and yet when she prayed, she was a forearm's length above the ground. So she did not speak within herself. She remembered her vow and made it that she had made to the Theotokos, and really through the Theotokos to, to God, and she fulfilled that vow. And when she came to some great temptation in the desert, instead of scurrying back to the city to go back to that life of laying in filth, as she called it, she remembered her vow and she begged God for help. And God was sometimes, perhaps in our mind, a little slow to help her. Didn't happen right away, not, not in a minute, not in an hour, sometimes in a day and a half. But she remembered her vow, and because of that, she was saved. So we should never speak within ourselves. We should never take our own counsel. We should never judge others. With, that's a voice inside. And also, there's other speaking within ourselves that is terrible. A lot of people have bad, the psychological term is self-talk. You're talking to yourself. Sometimes it's your own thoughts. Sometimes it's the thoughts that the demons suggest to you, but you're, you're prone to them. They can only suggest to you temptations that you're prone to. If you're not prone to a certain thing, they're going to suggest it once or twice, and then they're going to give up. But the things that work often, all the time, or often, they're going to continue to suggest. And so many of us have this trouble with bad self-talk about our bad self-image and that we're failures and, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's speaking within ourselves. Sometimes we judge ourselves horribly. No matter whether we judge ourselves horribly or not, all of us just about judge <coughs> others horribly by speaking within ourselves. So we have to learn not to speak within ourselves.
but to speak as St. Mary. And I think uh, having focus on something like a vow, like I told you, my vow with Daniel's list, and I vowed to someone that I would pray an akathist every day to help them, and I'm still praying that akathist every day. I've just expanded the list of people that I pray and make prostrations for, because that is, that is something to aim for. If you have no, no um, goals, then how are you going to get there? You've got to know the direction. You've got to go. So I'm not saying to just willy-nilly make vows because the scripture says let your yes be yes and your no be no. But we should make promises. We should make promises. And you should start fulfilling those promises. And therefore you're not speaking within yourself. Perhaps you should come to Father Nicholas or myself and say, is this a good idea? You know, some of you have sometimes come to me and said, I want to fast on Monday. And I ask you, well, how well do you fast on Wednesday and Friday? And if you don't fast well on Wednesday and Friday, don't add Monday. If you're not regularly saying a prayer rule, don't add Monday yet. How about if you just pray every day, and then we'll worry about whether you fast on Monday. So you could come to us and ask us about this. Then you're not speaking within yourself. But once you've made the vow, and we all made vows, then you fulfill it. We all have, many of us have children. We've made a vow. We have children. We've made a vow to care for those children. If we have a wife, if we have a husband, we made a vow to care for those, our wife or our husband. A priest has made a vow to care for his flock sacrificially. So you've all made vows. So when you're about to do something stupid and say something stupid and think something stupid, if you remember your vow, as Mary did, then that's not speaking within yourself. That's having your guardian angel remind you, or the Theotokos, or Christ, or one of the saints, remind you of what it is that you promised. So you should develop this. You should learn to make these promises about certain things. Perhaps it's something as simple as I promise that I'll, I'll pray a, 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 one a psalm a day, or a cathisma day, or something like that. Now, understandably, you know, I tell you I have Daniel's list. I, I have not, in the whatever, um, five and a half years since Daniel died, I haven't made every day. Sometimes things are just too difficult because of early morning services, lots of confessions, lots of counseling, travel, to go to prison, blah, 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 that I haven't sometimes fulfilled that list. But I would say that it's a very small number. So I basically fulfilled that vow. And it's not something that's within myself, really. It's something that's been given to God. So you should learn to do that. It's important because we have to have direction. One of the big problems about modern society is, of course, distraction, distraction, distraction. And the distraction from our phones, the distraction from social media, the distraction from movies and all the rest, we are just distracted. And now we've had whole generations of people that were raised completely electronic. And it's showing. It doesn't look good for our culture because of this distraction. So you have all these distractions. And if you have goals, then you have less distraction. If your goal is to say your morning prayers, well, maybe that'll make you not pick up your phone. If your goal is to forgive someone that you ha hold something against, maybe that'll make you do three prostrations a day for them. Because otherwise, you'll die. So that's how you learn to not speak within yourself. There's a lot more to it. It's different for every person. But basically, don't just go through life doing things like social media wants us to do. You see the next movie. You see the next thing. You do the next thing. You have the next uh, article. have the next little movie, blah, blah, blah. That is just terrible. Even people who study... Neurology, no, it's terrible for the brain, and it's way worse for the soul. But if you have direction, if you have purpose, then you'll be more free from this distraction, and you'll, have more, you'll make more progress. So, he speaks within himself, and of course the Lord hears what he says. Because the Lord hears everything, whether it's said aloud or not. And then he gives it in this question, Simon... I have something to say to you. Master, go ahead and say it. And then he gives this example of a person, two people, one who owes 500 pence in debt and 150. And in that culture, if you owe debt, you put in debtor's prison. Sometimes your children and your 
uh, were sold and your wife was sold for your debt. And of course, it's a horrible thing, a horrendous thing. 500, 500 pence, that's a lot. If, it, if, it was, if the word actually is denarius, a denarius is basically a day's wage. So a laborer who owed 500 would be in hock for over a year, over a year. How could he pay such a thing back? It would be impossible. So he's forgiven. And the one who has 50 is forgiven. Who loves him most? Well, of course, it's, it's not really a riddle. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Who's going to love him most? The one who's forgiven most. But then the Lord shows this beautiful uh, sort of twist on this, this uh, question that really is, is the way to be saved. Because so many people think of salvation as sort of a, this thing that is a transaction. Salvation is not a transaction with God. Salvation is the soul becoming like God. That's not a transaction. That's God's grace changing you. And what do we call God? Well, we call him many things, but we especially call him love. God is love. So anytime we love, we're becoming like God. So he uses forgiveness and love in a beautiful context. And you can read it in two different ways. There's one correct way to read it, or, or I guess both ways to some extent are correct because it's sort of circular. But the major way uh, that's correct, I'm going to tell you in a moment. So he kind of abrades Simon gently, says, I came into your house and you didn't do anything. But this woman, since I've come in, has not ceased to, to wash my feet. And then he says, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So we have that she is forgiven, for she loved much. How do we read this? Her sins are forgiven, and therefore she loves? Or she loves, and therefore her sins are forgiven? Which way do you read it? It's not absolutely clear from the grammar, but it is clear from the spirituality. We love much, and we are forgiven. Because we love God, and God fills us with himself, and we repent of our sins and we're forgiven of our sins, which is incidental, by the way. That's incidental. God forgives our sins because he wants to heal us of our sins, not just forgive them. What a terrible idea to be saved with sins. What a terrible idea. We're saved by our sins being blotted out, being destroyed and, and replaced with virtue. So the path to having your sins forgiven is love. Now, of course, as God forgives sins and enlightens us and heals us, we're filled with more love. So yes, it is true that we have our sins forgiven and we love because of the sins forgiven. Primary force is to love. And we've changed when we love. Because when we love, our heart is opened up. And God comes in our heart. And the light comes in our heart. And there's nothing but God in our heart. How can we not then be forgiven? Because there's nothing in us but God. Because all of those sins have been not just forgiven, but obliterated and replaced with God. So this is the way of life. Many of you, all of us, have sins that we can't get over, we can't change. Happens to all of us. Some of us have sins that are very pernicious, very shameful to us, very re repetitive. It's things that we can't even whisper to ourselves, maybe not even whisper to the priest. And how do you get over such things? Well, there's a saying that we used to have in my family. It's kind of a funny saying, kind of silly. It's hard to go into a corner and not think of a big white bear. It's not, not really possible. Just try it. You're told not to think of a big white bear. What do you think that you're not going to think of? The bear. So you cannot overcome your sins by uh, your own efforts and by prostrations and by repentance and all the rest. You can't do it. It is by the grace of God that you overcome your sins. And God has to be in the heart for you to overcome your sins. And God is love. So if we love as well as do the repentance... Absolutely, it's all necessary. If you love, you will repent because you feel this horrendous feeling that you, you're, not, you're not worthy of what God has given you. 
not, not in a way of being punished, but that you just don't want to disappoint, shall we say. Of course, God doesn't get disappointed. But to use it in human terms, to disappoint God by sin. So we learn to love. That's the key. That is the key to changing. Now, you've got to do all the other exercises as well. If you don't do the prostrations, if you don't try to pray a regular prayer rule in the morning and the evening, come to the church regularly, come to confession regularly, you're not going to be helped. But if you did all that stuff without love, you got no chance, zero, of salvation. The only way we can be saved is to learn to love, because God is love. Now, what about this one who is not forgiven? When little is forgiven, a person loves little. Is that true? I suppose it is true, but it's more true that the one who loves little is not forgiven very much. And then, of course, they're not forgiven very much, and they love even less. So if you love little, then you're a small person, a very small, crusty, hard heart. And God will not take a hammer and break open your heart. That's your job to do. He won't do it. He's capable of doing it, but he won't. The way you break open your heart is by expanding your heart with love. And then cracks appear, and then the light comes in. So if you love little, absolutely, you will have little forgiven because you won't change. And your heart will be cold and small and flinty, and dark, and God won't be in your heart. And if God is not in the heart, you're not saved. We want God in our heart. We want only God in our heart. Right now, we really can't make a mathematical equation out of it or a percentage. But right now, we have God in our heart, but we also have other things in our heart. And they interfere with our knowledge of God because they make us talk to ourselves, to speak within ourselves about our, our, ourselves and the other people. And we're always, almost always wrong when we do that. So we need to open our heart with love. Love is for everything, the reason for everything. That's why the standing joke in our catechesis is, if I ask a question, basically there's two answers, and you have 98% chance of being correct, even if you didn't hear the question and weren't listening. You either say love or you say prostrations, and you're going to be right. And most of the time it's love. So why... Did God make you? Why did he make man? Love. Why did Jesus become incarnate? Love. Why did he die on the cross? Love. Why did he establish his church? Love. Why do you follow the commandments? So why do we break down then? We say love for all those reasons and then we follow the commandments because otherwise we sin and we go to hell? No, we follow the commandments because of love. And as we love, the heart opens. And God enlightens us and helps us. What a beautiful thing. Why did St. Mary go into the desert? Because of love. Why did she lay on the ground a day and a half when she was trembling with lust and being burned up? Because of love. Because she, out of love, had made a vow to the one who loves her son uh, more than anyone ever has loved a son and who loves all of mankind and prays for us. She made a vow. And out of love, she fulfilled that vow. Out of gratitude. Because if you love, there's gratitude. So that's it. All of you that have troubles with your passions, which means basically everybody in this room who has troubles, every one of us has troubles. Every one of us has crises. Every one of us has bad days, bad months maybe, maybe bad years. But if we learn to love, then we will be saved. That's the key. Now, when you go through Holy Week, and I hope that you go through Holy Week by going to every service. But most of you won't. You know, it's not your habit. It's not what you become accustomed to. You have work in involvements and, and other things. Sometimes good reasons. Sometimes no real reason. But, but you know, if you went to all of them, I, what I want you to do if you go to all of them or one of them, look at Holy Week as, I don't want to be corny, like a love letter. God is showing how much he loves us. We should see the love of the Savior in everything that happens. Everything big and small that happens is love. We're saved by loving the one who loves us. And we learn to love him and then we change. And if we love much, we are forgiven much. That's the key. That's the key to forgiveness. It's not about feeling bad about your sin and everything. You feel bad about your sin because you love God. Love. Learn to love. Learn to forgive people. Learn to pray for people who are your enemies. Learn to be kind and you will be changed. 
and you will be the one who loves much and is forgiven much. St. Mary and all of the saints show that to us. May God teach us how to love. Amen.